on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. If you sat me down in front of a big red button and I knew if I pushed that button, I'd take us back to what you'd call the first beginning, it would be very tempted to push that button. The second beginning is the appearance of culture, the ability to think about the world in an abstract way. It seems like to build a civilization, you need to domesticate a grass. It can be rice, it can be corn, it can be you know, wheat or barley. Did Neanderthals have culture the way modern humans do? Wearing feathers, a necklace of eagle talons as art. At least some of them were doing this. As I see it, the Neolithic revolution hasn't really ended. I mean, it's not like everybody on the planet is currently living under a practicing agriculture. There are still holdouts. The trend towards global self-governance, it could be done the easy way or the hard way. I have some hope even over the next 10 years. I think there's reason for hope. We can make a better world. It can be done. Episode number 70 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Fifth Beginning, Six Million Years in the Future, with Dr. Robert Kelly, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival's annual colostrum sale is on now, and it's going strong. Right now, all colostrum products are 20% off with the coupon code HEALTHY2021. Colostrum is a sophisticated antiviral immune-boosting superfood that's well-known for its digestive tract regenerating properties, as well as its ability to assist in workout recovery and lean muscle building. I use Surthrival Colostrum just about every day in my morning smoothie. In fact, once you start using colostrum in blended drinks, nothing comes close to the flavor or texture. It's delicious and a truly functional food. Get over to surthrival.com and check out the entire product line. And be sure to use the coupon code HEALTHY2021 to get 20% off all colostrum products. Hey, new episodes of the Wild Fed TV show are airing each Monday on the Outdoor Channel at 7 p.m. Each episode is an adventure where we hunt, fish, and forage wild ingredients and then team up with cooks and chefs to create incredible meals that we share with our friends and loved ones. Check us out on Monday at 7 p.m. East and 11 p.m. East on the Outdoor Channel. Season 1 of Wild Fed is 10 episodes, and this week Outdoor Channel is airing episode 8 where we team up with forager chef Alan Burgo to hunt pigeons and forage wild mushrooms for a truly unforgettable meal. If you're like me and you don't have cable, you can use the app FriendlyTV.com, that's F-R-N-D-L-Y TV, like the word friendly, no vowels. It's less than 7 bucks a month and it gives you access to Outdoor Channel shows as they air, as well as a bunch of other networks too. And for our Canadian friends and family, you can see us on the Sportsman's Channel Canada, Tuesdays at 8 p.m. East. Also, I've been hosting live streams after the episodes air, so be sure to follow WildFed on social media or subscribe to our twice a month newsletter, The Subsistence, to get notified about those. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The WildFed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. In his new book, The Fifth Beginning, archaeologist and anthropologist Dr. Robert Kelly proposes a way of looking at the human saga that divides our history up into five distinct turning points, what he calls beginnings. Times of radical transition that fundamentally alter the way we live on the planet and with one another. The story starts with what he calls the first beginning, the advent of technology, and in particular, the beginning of the use of stone tools. This industry began at least a couple million years before the present, but it could be even older, and it set us on a path towards the present day. It's interesting to note that this phase predates our species, and it was instead carried out by other hominins, Humans that emerged before us, but not sapiens. Species like Homo heidelbergensis and Homo erectus. The second beginning, starting sometime in the past 200,000 years, is the advent of culture, loosely defined by our use of the symbolic, left behind as cave art and artifacts like jewelry and other adornments. It's also characterized by the capacity for religion, a defining trait of our own species Homo sapiens, but perhaps of other than contemporary hominins namely Homo neanderthalensis. Next comes the transition, at least of some cultures, away from hunting and gathering towards agriculture, or the third beginning. This takes place far more recently than past beginnings, something like 10 or 12,000 years ago, and it's often referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. And revolution's probably a good way to refer to it as plant and animal husbandry set in motion changes that would fundamentally alter the landscape of our planet and our relationship to it. The fourth beginning arises around 6,000 years ago, with the advent of the state, from the earliest city-states up to the great empires of the world. 
This leads to stratified hierarchical social structures, written language, the advent of money, and the large-scale war that so often characterizes our species today. All of this, of course, is a very useful framework for looking at human history, but Dr. Kelly goes further, arguing that we've already entered what he calls the fifth beginning, a turning that not only characterizes many of the fundamental changes we're witnessing right now, today, but might leave us some clues about trends still yet to come. This is a fascinating conversation, and we range across both time and geological space as we review human antiquity and speculate about our future, too. Dr. Robert Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks uh, for coming on, man. And where are you right now in the world? I'm in Laramie, Wyoming. Mm, What's the temperatures like there? Well, it's actually not terribly cold, although it's supposed to get below zero over the weekend. And we've got some terrific wind today and uh, the, <laughs> yeah. whole, the whole week, which is normal for, uh, for Lar- Laramie, but, but it's, it's even excessive for Lar- Laramie. Okay. I'm up in Maine and it's just finally getting cold here, drying out a little bit, you know? So. Oh, I used to live in, I used to live in South, South China, Maine. No way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not too far. You know, um, I'm in the lakes region, so I'm always seeing all those signs, you know, for, for all these foreign country named towns. <laughs> so no, that's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of them up there. Peru, there I think. Are. You know? yeah, yeah, Peru, exactly. Them. Sweden. <laughs> yeah, quite a few of them. Well, that's cool, man, that you were here. Um, a lot of folks aren't really familiar with the area, so uh, I'd love to get out to Wyoming, man. never been out there. Um, I want to talk to you today about your newest book, and um, I really want to explore human history and the timeline of it through the framework that you propose there. So, but I, I thought we could start off, maybe you could tell people a little bit about your background academically and, and, and in archaeology, and just so people get a sense of where you're coming from. And then we could go into, um, you know, a little bit of a summary of, of what your interest is now and what you've been writing about. Well, uh, I've been uh, doing archaeology, professional archaeology, since I was uh, 16 year, years old. So it's getting, it's getting close to 50 years now of, <laughs> of involvement in the, in the field. That was working out in the state of Nevada. And I did that repeatedly for many, many years, but moved on to uh, different, different areas. And I've spent the last 20 odd years uh, in, in Wyoming and the, the, the greater Wyoming area. Um, my, my background is all training in anthropology from my bachelor's degree on through my, my PH, PhD. And I have always had a deep interest in uh, hunting and, and gathering peoples. And that's, that's what I've focused on through archaeological work uh, and also through, through some uh, ethnographic and some ethnological work as, as well. What was the, uh, what drew you to it? Um, what, you know, what was the spark for you or, or what was the passion for you that led you to immerse your life in this kind of work? Well, I, I, I suppose um, the, the interest in hunting and gathering peoples really, really comes out of an interest in, in Native American cultures. And I, I admit a, a somewhat romantic uh, vision of what life was like in those uh, so- societies. Um, and so I was always interested in sort of living off the land and living closer to the land. And uh, that, that just leads you to hunting and gathering uh, peoples. And then I spent a lot of time uh, walking through farmer's fields looking for arrowheads and things when I was very, very young. And that led me to an interest in uh, uh, archaeology. So it's, I wanna, oh, it's, yeah, it's that's kind of a romantic image, which I, I've dispensed with now. Uh, but, uh, but I still think there's some things about those societies that uh, we today can learn something from. That's, uh, I feel like we're a little too early in and I already want to pick apart some of what you just said because I'm so interested <laughs> in it. Because I'm so guilty of that uh, romanticizing the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. At the same time, um, I think even when we're clear-eyed about it, you know, it's undeniable that, you know, you see these stories of like folks who were kidnapped as children, but then really don't want to leave and return back to the civilized life way. And mm-hmm. I find all that stuff really fascinating, you know, but at the same time, um, and maybe you want to comment on it, but I find another thing that I find fascinating here in North America where we are, I'd say we're still pretty deep in romanticizing those cultures, maybe more than ever. And 
so little mention of the of the intertribal warfare and torture, particularly torture that was so common here in North America. Um, so, so and you know the child mortality and all those kind of things too. So I think it's like uh, I feel very romantic about them, but I also understand you know that there were some significant hardships and high chance of uh, horrible death <laughs> awaiting you at the same time. Yeah, un- unfortunately, that's that's true. It it it, it probably ebbed and flowed. Uh, probably linked to the availability of, of foods and how much competition there was for access to foods, access to land. So it, it sort of went up and down. We can see that in uh, the, the history of uh, Native American societies, that the, the evidence for violence is, is, there's sort of always a constant level there, just, just as there is anywhere in the, in the world. But the evidence for sort of really destructive warfare, that that goes up and down. And it probably is going up and down with uh, competition produced by uh, numbers of people on the landscape, coupled with uh, environmental change that that affects the availability of food. What about the cultural component? Because those are sort of like ecological components, but then there's the cultural component of this is how you get status in your community. This is how you show your you know, you've entered into warriorhood or manhood as you, you go out on the war path or something like that. And so there's, you know, do you think that all of those cultural components were driven by ecological parts or, or are they, do they just go hand in hand? I, I, I think they more or less go hand in hand that when, when a society needs there to be warriors who are willing to uh, risk, uh, risk their lives for everyone else, well, culture comes up with ways to, uh, uh, trying to uh, encourage that that level of of, of behavior, yeah. and when it's not needed, uh, it, it tends yeah. to fall off. Uh, the, although it can it can take on a life of its of its own, and and we, we see that in militaries t- today, they become bl- locked in. Uh, yeah. So I so I don't think it's anything inherent. In in people, I mean the the Iroquois were were known as really terrifying war, warriors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but that that probably came out of a, a extraordinary competition as well in terms of like I said population and then climate changes that to reduce the availability of foods, and then on top of that. Uh, you get Europe, Europeans arriving right. who have got these these trade goods, and you really want access to the trade goods, in part because one of the trade goods is weapons. Right, and right. That, Me- and that, metal in general, right? Like me- metal, metal in general. Metal in general, yeah. Metal, yeah. metal points, but also metal pots, but then, but then guns. I yeah. mean, the reason the Lakota, who are from the the Minnesota area, they were uh, horticultural folks. Uh, who were pushed out of Minnesota onto the Great Plains by the Ojibwe, who had gotten hold of guns from trade with the with the with the French, and they they turned them onto the the Lakota, who fled onto the the plains. Just so happened that there were horses coming up from the south <laughs> at yeah. the same time from the Spanish, and the uh, the Lakota adopted this. Uh, horse mounted bison hunting mastered it really huh mastered it yeah such a fascinating thing all those converging forces all happening i want to ask this question for you i've already got you way off track and i do want to get back to your book but um when i think about agriculturalists um you know i picture what happened you know in the middle east or in china um i guess in indonesia um, but also in Mesoamerica and into South America, you get these centers of agriculture and domestication that take place. And when we talk about North America, pre-Columbian history, you know, we tend to talk about them as hunter-gatherers, but then there's all this horticulture that's going on and all this gardening that's happening. And it seems to me, if I understand it right, that it sort of radiates out of agricultural centers in Mesoamerica. Uh, I just am wondering if you make any distinction when you're talking about um, and writing about the agricultural revolution. Is there any distinction there? Do you sort of consider the North American people to be kind of a, a, a center of agriculture as well? Or do you consider the way that they approach it different, um, you know, in your sort of um, big picture worldview about agriculture in general? 
Well, the the primary food in in North America, the primary uh, uh, agricultural food, of course, was was maize, uh, and maize is originally domesticated in uh, southern uh, Mexico, coming from a wild plant known as teosinte. Uh, but there were before there was there was maize in North America, in in eastern North America, folks were starting to. Uh, uh, domesticate uh, a series of of plants, uh, including sun sunflower, and but other th other quinopods and uh, sumpweed and uh, b various kinds of plants, uh, b including some uh, some gourds and and squashes. Uh, but those those plants were, were eventually replaced by uh, corn. Mm, beginning about or around AD 800 or so. Uh, and the, those, those indigenous plants in the Eastern woodlands probably didn't have the capacity to go on and do what a corn was eventually able to do. They just didn't mm -hmm. have enough genetic plasticity to be as productive as, oh, as caloric corn density. Was. Huh? Right. Right. Corn, corn was the one, and corn's a very adaptable plant. It moved all the way up into southern uh, Canada before it really reached its 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 limit. It needs a ninety day growing season. Uh, so, so folks in the eastern United States were certainly working at it, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, corn replaced all of those plants uh, eventually. It seems like uh, to build a civilization, you need to domesticate a grass, right? So it can be rice, it can be corn, it can be you know wheat or barley. But it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like it's always sort of centers around a grain uh, of the fruit of a grass. Pretty, pretty much so. There are some that center around some some root uh, crops, but uh, those are generally not associated with the the level of. Uh, 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 Population growth. Right. That's, City states don't come out right. of taro, for instance, right? Or correct. Cassava or something like that. Right. Yeah, it's really interesting. I guess uh, one more question, and then I'm going to bring it back to the topic. Um, I was reading that you have an interest in um, the peopling of North America uh, during the Pleistocene, which is this time in history that, as particularly for me as a hunter um, and as somebody who's interested in, in you know, mammals of North America, wow, what a time it would have been to have arrived on this continent. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, there were a lot of big animals. Yeah. A lot of big and just, a, and quite bizarre, uh, menagerie of animals too, uh, in some ways. And, um, at least to our eyes today. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to give you some space to comment on that. And I also wanted to ask you about, um, you, I guess, where's the science today or, or what are people speculating and what do you speculate led? Uh, there's, there was always the talk of people walking across and now I'm hearing a lot more about the potential that people traveled along coastal routes and, um, you know, glaciated areas and stuff, uh, by canoe. Um, and anyway, I'm just curious if you think that, uh, people walked or did they, did they boat and, uh, you know, when did this happen and what are your thoughts on the sort of the peopling of North America? What's your interest there? The it, it, I, I'm I'm someone who's uh, what what we call in the field a, a short chronologist. I I don't think people have been here as long as some other people have have argued. There was recently a paper in in uh, published in Nature, which is usually considered the gold standard of mm -hmm. uh, uh, public publication. Uh, it, and it, it's from a site in Mexico where they they claim to have had people there since thirty three thousand years ago. Oh, uh, it's it, it's it's completely wrong. It's the what they show as artifacts are they're not artifacts. They're just broken rocks. So uh, there, there there's always cases like this. Uh, three years ago, there was a case in California f saying that there were people in California one hundred and thirty thousand years ago. That was also published in Nature, and it's also completely wrong. These these journals, by the way, Nature, by the way, does not publish uh, re rebuttals to their their articles. Okay. So you have to publish it elsewhere, and the journalists don't don't pick up on it. So uh, that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the the earliest evidence is about fourteen and a half thousand year, years ago. Uh, that comes from a cave in Oregon called Paisley Paisley Cave, where they have, believe it or not. 
it's human poop, dried human poop. Uh, that that dates to around lights, They're called co- 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 uh, co- copper lights. Copper lights. Co- okay. Copper lights. Uh, that's fourteen and a half thousand years years old. There's some other evidence there too, but that's the really good solid dating uh, evidence. And uh, and I suspect that that's that that's about the earliest. Uh, did people come along the coast, the western coast, or did they come through the, the ice-free corridor between the ice sheets in Canada? Uh, we're not really sure, in part because we don't fully understand when the ice-free corridor was open and when it was actually habitable by, by people. That's, that's still research to be, to, be, to be done. They could have come along the coast. Uh, I, I, frankly, I'm always baffled by people who find it fascinating that they had boats. A, a, a <laughs> Go to Hawaii. <laughs> well, well, and if you're gonna if you're gonna travel to Hawaii across 2,500 miles of open ocean, you have to be a very, very serious sailor. But but if you just want to take a canoe along the shore. Right, right. It's just a dugout canoe, That's which simple, yeah. is not that hard to, to make. I mean, it's a lot of physical labor, but mm-hmm. uh, it's not conceptually difficult to right. to think about it or or to to construct it. So, uh, I, I, I people could have come along the coast. They, yeah, they used some boats. Uh, that western coast of North America would have always been sort of. You would have had to island hop along it, no matter. Would it have been along like the Aleut? What's today the Aleutian Islands? It's that's the idea. Is they during a time of lower sea sea level, right? The the Aleutian Islands would have been more or or less a continuous stretch of of land, Uh, and uh, much of the places that they would have been occupying on the shore is now under. In some places, it's under a hundred meters of 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 water. Very, mm-hmm. very cold water too, so it's hard to uh, ex- explore. <laughs> yeah. So I don't find it strange that people could have used boats to come along that part of the coast, but I would find it strange for them to continue on boats down the coast of the, the western coast of the right, new, right, the new right. world. Okay. I, I, I still think, based on what I know about hunter gatherers, once they got south south of the ice sheets, which would have been at about the state of Wyoming. They would have turned uh, inland, and they would have started going up some of the major uh, rivers, like the Columbia River, and gone the, into the uh, interior. There's been um, a lot of debate about the um, what happened to the Pleistocene megafauna here. I'm just c- curious your opinion. You know, about, you know, do you see this as a climate change event leading to these? you know, pretty mass extinctions here? Or do you think that the, you know, what is it? 32 genera or something like that? Yeah. Lost. Yeah. Not, not do just you think 32. This could have been hunting. Oh, go ahead. Well, they certainly hunted these animals. So we have direct evidence for it. We're actually excavating a uh, mammoth kill site in Wyoming. Now, uh, if, if, if COVID will let us get back to it, we'll be there mm. this summer. Uh, so we have direct evidence for this, for, for some of the species. We don't have uh, really direct evidence for some of the other species who went uh, uh, extinct. So uh, it, did, did people do it? Or if people had never been here, would those animals have gone extinct anyways? This is, this is a very hard question to uh, answer. And it's... Um, I have a, a colleague here, uh, Todd Surville, who's done a number of analyses of the radiocarbon dates off of these remains and the, the radiocarbon dates that date a human presence. And it's just really suspicious <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that these animals are, are going along just fine for literally tens of thousands more years. And then humans show up and they all go extinct. Of course, there was a very dramatic climate change at the same time that humans arrived. I tend to think that it's both of those factors to put, to put, to put together, that the, the climate change was making it more difficult for those animals. And so if a predator comes in like, like humans and they're exploiting a naive fauna that they could, that, that they could have at first killed fairly easily, 
it's never an easy thing to kill a mammoth, I'm sure. Yeah. But, wow. but, 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 but it could have been simpler if those animals were naive of a two-legged uh, pre predator, mm -hmm. that they could have helped the, the process along. It, in my opinion, I don't think we have an absolute definitive answer yet, and I'm not sure that we ever will. The bow was already, you know, 14,000 years ago. The bow's in existence. These people have ballistic weapons, not just, you know, thrusting weapons or not just addle addles, but they have a uh, bow and arrow to assist in uh, these hunts? Pro probably not. The, okay. the, the, the bow and arrow did seem to be around fairly early on over in Europe, but uh, we, we suspect that people in the continental United States we're probably using the atolatl until uh, sometime between 1,500 and 2,000 years ago. Wow. The, the, yeah, the, the bow and arrow is no fairly, fairly recent. The atolatl oh is a pretty dang deadly weapon. A good one for hunting uh, a mammoth, too. It's a pretty large it, target. It's good for hunting a mammoth. You can put a large projectile onto it. Right. Uh, it, it has some heft behind it. Arrows do not. Um, so it's, it's a pretty deadly weapon and, and there are, you know, there's a international Adelatl association that holds competitions yeah, yeah, yeah. and there, there are some folks out there who are really good at it. Uh, I've done it myself. Uh, I've, I've, I've shot with, with people who are really good at it and they can hit that target time after time again. They, and as they, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot of practice to develop at least a base competency in it. I mean, it's a fairly intuitive weapon system, really. I mean, obviously, to get to where you have precision takes time, but, uh, you know, you can hand one to a novice and in an hour, they're throwing it pretty well, usually. That's, that's absolutely true. We, we teach it to our, our field school students. Oh, cool. And, they're, and they're, they're, they're doing it, you know, with within one, one lesson. Some right. are better than others, but it's... It's fairly straightforward, uh, and it's not a, a, a really complicated technology to ma to manufacture. A, a, a bow and arrow, especially the bow, that that that's that's a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. You got to get the right wood and uh, and and do it just 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 right to make a to make a bow powerful enough to to take down a larger animal. Were, were there? This is something I've n I've never really been able to ask anybody. But were, is there a corresponding extinction? in other parts of the world of species of megafauna, everything I read about the Pleistocene is North American. Is there a reason for that? Or were, were there corresponding extinctions elsewhere of other large animals? Many, many of the other, there, there, there were some extinctions, but because people had been around for so right. long in right. other parts of the world, um, it's, it's really not, not clear what's, what's the cause of it. We can say that when humans show up on uh, island in environments, uh, animals go extinct. Yeah. It happened in Madagascar, it happened in New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. the, the larger animals, they, they're, they go to, yeah. they, they become extinct. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I, I, you know, bringing us back to where we started here, I, I'm very guilty of, if you gave, if you sat me down in front of a panel with a big red button and I knew if I pushed that button, I'd take us back to, I guess, maybe what you'd call the first beginning. <laughs> mm. I would be very tempted to push that button. Um, you know, I know that there's the romanticism and the sort of strange sense of uh, evolutionary nostalgia, but I, I look at the impact of many of the major turning points in human history and I'm I'm not always convinced these have been good for us or for the world. And so I'm really intrigued today to look at the world through your framework. I think your book, The Fifth Beginning, lays out a really interesting, uh, or it gives a really interesting paradigm through which to view human history. So I was hoping you could lay that out and maybe I could jump in from time to time with my questions, but I, I really want to hear you kind of lay out the premise of that book for new listeners and um i, I want to get a sense of where you how you view this whole thing that's unfolded in the last you know however you want to frame it three hundred thousand years of human history we'll get right back to the show in a moment but first 
Wild Fed is proud to be brought to you by the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. Salmon Sisters delivers frozen and smoked wild salmon direct to your door, as well as some other wild Alaskan species like cod and halibut. The Salmon Sisters, Emma and Claire, and their all-women team are headquartered in Homer, Alaska, where they make their livelihood harvesting wild seafood from Alaska's pristine and bountiful waters. Check out their Wild Alaskan co-host salmon box for vacuum-sealed individual serving size portions or their Wild Alaskan sockeye salmon box for full fillets that'll feed your whole family or fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready-to-eat smoked salmon pouches. I keep one of those in my backpack for food emergencies. They're in a beautiful gold mylar packaging. And their smoked salmon tins, which are also ready to eat. They've also got a great cookbook, super cool women's clothing designs, and their own custom line of printed Extra Tough brand boots. If you're not familiar with Extra Tough, they are the fishing boot of Alaska. Go over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your first order of wild fish. And if you want to get to know Emma and Claire a bit better, listen to episode number 51 of this podcast. It's called Made of Salmon, the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. And again, you can find them at aksalmonsisters.com and the coupon code is WILDFED. Now, back to the show. Well, the, the, the book, The Fifth Beginning, it takes, uh, it takes what I think is archaeology strength, which is being able to look at uh, human history in very, very broad strokes across time and, and space. And uh, the, the, the evidence that archaeologists use, of course, is all material remains. That's, that's all that we can really look, look for. And one of the things we notice is that when there's a, a shift in the kinds of, of artifacts that we find, that shift is usually associated with some other shift in the nature of human uh, society and in terms of how those societies have organized them, themselves. So I took the book and said, let's, let's step back. It's as if we're, we're, we're going to watch an IMAX film on the entire history of the, of the world. And look for those places where uh, the the material signature of humanity dramatically changes, and look at what's happening to human society at those points in time. And so I, I come up with four uh, previous beginnings. Um, I prefer that word to transition because transition is just a boring word, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. the, the 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 first one is really the origins of tech technology, which is the origins of stone stone tools, or at least that's how it's manifested to, uh, to us. And that, that really resulted in a dramatic change in the way our ancestors were uh, operating and the capacities that it, it gave them. It resulted in one early migration about a million and a half years ago out of uh, Africa. The second one is- Of who? The, uh, of, of what species? Uh, that would be like, uh, depends on who you talk to, be Homo erectus, Homo ergaster. Okay. And these are also, um, this is also a species of hominin that has fire at the time of the migration? They they might. <laughs> We're not entirely sure. Earliest really definitive evidence for fire, I suspect, is around uh, 300,000 years ago, but it's okay. probably much earlier than that. We do not know for certain. Because I want to just add a comment here. Uh, the par- a thing that challenges me, I think, in when I look at the pop literature, um, which is like the you know layperson interpretation of the science, there's such an emphasis on the stone tools because they survive, you know, the millennia. And as somebody who's done some applied archaeology and practiced some primitive skills, you know, you realize the importance of the fiber arts, for instance. Um, you know, of the ability to, you know, produce fire on a landscape is often tied to plants, not stone tools. And so your ability to make a bow drill or even more simply a hand drill, you know, it's like um, understanding of some core properties of wood and selecting the right woods and the ability to produce fire is pretty simple. Uh, But that stuff doesn't, you know, these fire kits, unless we're talking about like, you know, ice mummies, they don't survive very well. Right. So it's kind of, you know, and then what, what do we find for fire? Be hearth sites and charred remains and things. 
You'd find hearth hearth sites, and and there's a a lot of debate for certain things that people have found. There's one, for example, in a cave in South Africa that's argued to be a a million years years old, but it's sometimes hard to tell whether this area of burned earth is was an intentional hearth or right. whether it was an accidental fire. Yeah. So that's yeah, so that's what the whole debate revolves around. But regardless, when you're talking about this beginning and you're talking about stone tools, you're, I mean, obviously the fiber arts and the fire technology, are all of those kind of encompassed by this um, period of time you're talking about? Uh, pro probably. Uh, since we, it doesn't preserve, it's hard for us to talk about. Mm -hmm. my, my assumption always has been that if you've got people working things, working wood, working plant materials, they're, they're they're almost certainly going to need stone tools in order to work mm -hmm. that that material. Right. Right. So the, the, the presence of stone tools uh, is probably signaling that we've got other kinds of organic te technology present mm -hmm. as, as well. And we probably did not have a, a period of time when there was nothing but organic technology because you need the stones need the stone. to work yeah. the, that te technology. Logically, as a non-scientist who can speculate it at, at will, um, it seems obvious that that would be the first thing is like, I'll break this with rock, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it does seem like logical to me. Um, but what's the oldest stone tool? You know, I've seen stuff about um, Australopithecus afarensis, you know, 3.6 million years ago, like potential scavenged bones with, you know, crush and cut marks on it. You know, where do you kind of pinpoint it? Well, the uh, there there are there, there there's definitely stone tools by two point five two point six million years ago. That's amazing. Uh, every, everyone agrees on that. There there are some stone tools that have been uh, they're dated to about three point three million years ago uh, in uh, Eastern Africa, but there there is some de debate over the uh, the age, and there's also debate about exactly who was manufacturing those those tools there are there are some suggesting that some of these early stone tools are are actually built uh made by um uh chim, chim, chimpanzee uh, ancestors oh wow okay uh so we can say definitely two and a half 2.6 million years ago probably not any earlier than 3.3 million years ago it's amazing. Okay, so so I kind of derailed you there, but you were talking about that first beginning being this this uh, the, use the, of tools and technology, right? The, the the appearance of stone tools. The 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 next beginning, the second beginning, is is much later. Probably occurs between a hundred and two hundred thousand years ago, and and that's the appearance of of culture. Mm. Uh, and that's that's the appearance of the ability to think about the world in an abstract way, to uh, be able to tell stories, to have mythologies, to have legends, uh, to, to for the, the capacity for religion, uh, and the capacity to produce art. And I and I think that's what it's signaled is by the production of uh, art objects, body de decorations, beads. Uh, Eagle talons, necklaces of eagle talons. Uh, that's that's all appearing by at least 120,000 years ago, and possibly earlier, but probably not earlier than 200,000 years ago. And and I don't know if this takes you out of your you know area of expertise at all, but I have been seeing more and more stuff that maybe Neanderthals were also, you know, participating in culture like this and in having you know artifacts that may have been artistic and things like that? Or, you know, do you subscribe to that? And do you think that uh, other species besides sapiens were um, developing culture like this? Other hominins? In the, in the last couple of years, I, I've been working on a, a project while I've spent some time in Germany on a Humboldt Fellowship. And while there, I've been working on a, a project that uh, it entailed putting together a database of all the art objects from about 40 to 200,000 years ago in Europe and Africa. So it's taken some time to, to compile all this, this information. Um, 
And if you had asked me a few years ago, did Neanderthals have culture the way modern humans do? I would have said no. I would have said this this is the primary difference between Neanderthals and modern modern humans. I, I, I think I'm wrong. There is evidence for it among Neanderthals, and it uh, it's it's as abundant as you might expect the evidence to be for that distant time time period. And this this entails uh, uh, it appears to entail some art on cave cave walls. It also oh, wow. entails uh, yeah, there's a little bit of it in in Spain. Uh, it's been dated to more than uh, sixty thousand years ago. That's how we know. Is it that how that, we know because that's, of that's, age? that's how we know. That's how we know. Okay. Yeah, because right. modern humans were not there. Were no modern right humans there. there. Yeah. Right. Okay. And there's some eagle talons that have been specifically cut off, and and not just one or two, but a bunch. Uh, mm. There are the the humeri of of certain bird species, mostly raptors and uh, corvids, like ravens and so on that have mm -hmm. had their flight feathers cut off. We can tell this by the location of the cut marks on the bone. So they're, they're going after very particular feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's- Same ones I'd go after. <laughs> yes. Know, those and that's, primary feathers. Yeah. Yes. And that's at about 120,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, uh, it's been found in several places, including a cave in uh, Croatia. So I, I look at all that and go, geez, I, I, I've got to be wrong. Uh, I mean, if I accept- yeah. The, the production of art, including just simple body decorations like wearing feathers or a necklace of eagle talons as as art, and and I do, then uh, then I have to accept that Neanderthals, at least some of them, were were doing this. I so, wish so, so much yeah, to I, know what happened with with the sapiens and the and the Neanderthals. I mean, I know it's just shrouded in mystery, but it's such a curious event, their disappearance. It's, and it's a very they're, curious they're showing event. showing up in our mitochondrial DNA and you know? all. Yeah, we were obviously uh, doing it with, <laughs> with, 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 with the Neanderthals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I wouldn't uh, do too well today, but. So so then after that, the, the third beginning is uh, the origins of agriculture and the, the appearance and the spread of domesticated plants and animals uh, and that entails a, a dramatic shift in how people are living from a largely nomadic to a much more sedentary uh, life life way um, and the the fourth transition is the origin of the of the state of large imperialistic organizations that have leaders that have uh, great advances in science and the arts uh, but also slavery and warfare on a massive scale, standing armies, the, the production of uh, weapons that are uh, whose sole purpose is to kill is to kill people. What are, what are your preferred dates for um, the agricultural revolution, and then also for the you know early city states? Because um, I know we see things like Gobekli Tepe and stuff like that that have kind of maybe start to alter some of our understanding of this stuff, but obviously we're looking at like 6,000 years for, you know, cuneiform writing and stuff like that. So where do you put the Neolithic revolution and where do you put um, the first city states? Well, the, 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 the appearance of agriculture and then, and then uh, states or city, city states, uh, it appears at different times in different places. Yeah. So agriculture, it's probably earliest in the in the Near East with cultivating wheat and uh, barley, among some others. Uh, and it doesn't appear until sometime later in other parts of the world, rice in the Far East and uh, maize in the in the New World, potatoes in the Highland uh, uh, Andes. All of those have different uh, different times of appearance and different times of when people sort of fully commit to to them but they're all happening after about 12,000 years years ago and the, the same is true with with uh, with state societies the earliest ones appear uh they're they're, they're probably earliest in what's now uh, iraq in the southern tigris Euph euphrates uh region that's the uh, uruk uh state uh and then they they appear later in other parts of the of the world 
There's a so there isn't really, just, there isn't just one, you know. It's not like right, one morning right. you wake up and boom, everything's changed. It's it's a it's a it, in in geologic time it's a very very rapid tra- transition. In 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 human time, it occurred slowly in different at different times in different different places. There's um just looking at what you've laid out so far. There's a um a real uh, diminishment in the time between each of these transitions, like the periodicity yes. isn't even, right? So it's like yeah. big chunk gets down to little short chunks. And now for me, and I'm sure for you even more so as an archaeologist, when you start saying 6,000 years ago, it's like you're saying yesterday to me. You know, it's so recent yeah. in our history. So um, this is an accelerating phenomenon that you're talking about. It's, it's It does appear to be an accelerating phenomenon. Uh, and I, I then argue in the book that we're actually in the middle of the fifth beginning, which probably started you know, roughly around AD 1500. Um, uh, and and when I lecture on this, someone in the audience usually points out just what you pointed out, which was the time between these transitions is getting shorter and shorter. So they want to know, when is the sixth beginning? <laughs> going, to, going to start isn't isn't it going to start you know tomorrow right um and i i usually tell them you know look we let's we'll, we'll, we'll let, let's get through the fifth beginning and then and then we'll worry <laughs> about the sixth <laughs> it's probably after my lifetime so yeah uh, I, yeah i want to get through this one first so and, and impossible uh, it's probably to predict you know, with the type of technology that is emerging, like it's pretty yes. hard to imagine what kind of world it would be. Yeah. And it's also possible that we'll plateau mm-hmm. for a while. I, I can't really say. Do you think it's uh, possible that it, we could revert and crumble down? I mean, there's all these, you, you see these conversations about um, the collapse of, you know, all these civilizations that go back, you know, to the early agriculture and into those early city states it's like one by one they fall like dominoes um it's it's true every 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 civilization that's ever existed has has uh well collapsed is a word that a lot of archaeologists don't like transformed might be a better word and they don't really disappear the the maya uh state it disappeared those massive centers They've all had to be, uh, you know, uncovered from the from the jungle. Yeah. Most yeah. of them have been uncovered from the from the jungle because they just ceased to, to operate. But the Maya people did not cease to exist. They're mm-hmm. they're still there today. Yeah. So uh, this um, uh, societies change over over time. They in, they indeed yeah. change. Uh, would we revert back to the, uh, the halcyon days of living as a, a hunter-gatherer? Uh, nope, <laughs> not not unless we had a, a an enormous population loss. The Reduction, world, yeah. the world can only support a, a population of maybe about a global population of maybe ten million at uh, under a uh, hunting on- and gathering ad- adaptation. And there is so, I mean, as a modern, I, I like to think of myself as a, as a contemporary hunter gatherer in the nutritional sense, obviously not in the cultural sense. Um, and one thing that I often point out to folks, uh, because when you're in that world, as you can imagine, there's a lot of identity politics, there's a lot of back and forth and the hierarchy of who's doing it more and all that kind of stuff. So in that world, people always like accuse you of not being you know, enough of a hunter gatherer or whatever it is. It's kind of some silly stuff that I deal with. And something I'm always pointing out to people is like, Hey man, I don't have access to the land base that (laughs) people had access to. I don't have access to the same kind of species diversity, the naivety of big game that you were talking about before, not to mention the amount of ecological knowledge that had been passed on culturally for generations. Um, I'm kind of starting over, (laughs) you know, uh, so the idea that we could, you know, I guess, what was the number you just said? 300, how many people could it support off wild uh, systems? The, the, the world, it's, it's a hard number to, to course, estimate, course, but, but, but the world can probably only support about 10 million people. Uh, okay. I wonder if, if that's true today or if that's 
if that's the past too, is it 10 million with today's ecosystems? I mean, you know, in some ways when I'm foraging, uh, human disturbance creates lots of new niches for plants that are, um, you know, very useful to me. So like I'll go to, you know, old farms, for instance, or even working farms today, it can be fantastic habitat for some of the species I'm looking for. But then there's also just these areas that are just basically decimated or far too toxic to <laughs> harvest from, you know, there's super fun sites, not where you want to be, you know, getting no. your cattails from or whatever. So, so the idea of reverting back, yeah, of course I don't see that, but, um, but it, it's interesting to me as we start talking about, I guess what I'd want to hear from is a little bit about how you characterize this fifth beginning. And because um, that's what I wonder if we could almost be set back a little bit by the, I guess what I really, what I'm saying is I see a kind of hubris in our current culture that seems to reflect something. It's a like a reflection of the hubris in other civilizations just before their sort of collapse or transition takes place. And I wonder so much, you know, how far we can actually take this thing, how far can it really go? Uh, but, you know, tell me about, uh, oh, and actually I would like to add one more thing, which is, <clears throat> and, and I'd love your feedback and tell me if you think this is wrong thinking. I often tell people that as I see it, the Neolithic revolution hasn't really ended. I mean, it's not like everybody on the planet is currently, living under a practicing agriculture, there are still holdouts. So, so this has been a long process. It's not like it, like you said before, it didn't happen overnight. And, you know, you do have peoples in Indonesia and South America and Africa, who we call so-called uncontacted people. Um, what, what is the island off the coast of India that we still like, can't even get, you know, any oh, contact I see, with, I see, right? Uh, the, uh, Andaman Island or something. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable story. Just unbelievable. So, so this is like, you know, some of these beginnings are are not completely done unfolding yet either. Would you say that's true or not true? Uh, they're they're not completely done. Uh, they're the they're, there are very few people who right. live by hunting and gathering for a significant amount of their of their diet, right. and and they're they're all affected in some way or or another you, you know there are there are folks who live by hunting and gathering but they're also doing some kind of wage wage labor for mm -hmm. their neighbors who are uh hort horticulturalists they might be collecting goods that uh are are then sold on the international market if if you right. go to a store and buy furniture made out of uh, rattan cane there's a very good chance it was p collected by Punan hunter gatherers in uh, Bor Borneo. Wow, you know, like as if, like as if the thing that was going on with the English and the French, you know, five hundred years ago, still going on, right? Yeah, it's, it's still going on. It's still, it's still happening. Uh, and, and folks like the Punan are also affected by the amount of logging that's going on in their uh, course, environments. Yeah. The Andaman yeah. Islanders, who, uh, yeah, you, you, if you go to the Andaman Islands, you're probably going to die. <laughs> Sucking uh, up arrows. <laughs> yes, and and uh, but but that attitude is really a, a product of their uh, history with colonial governments. They've just decided no. No, we're not going to have anything to do with you guys. If you come here, we will kill you. So they that, but that attitude is is a function of their existing in a, a world of of colonial societies. There was a what time you, when you when you could go but, there. You know. Okay. Okay. Understood. What do you What do you as a not as a scientist, but a, personally? I guess I'm curious, um, before we move on in the conversation, just how you feel about it all in the sense of, you know, I, I think like the first wheat seeds being intentionally cultivated as like this very significant turning point in human history. But I also think like the last hunter gatherers disappearing might be one of the most significant stories in human history. Maybe one of, yeah, it's in the top three for me, yet it might not even really make the news. You know, when it happens, like when the last subsistence hunter gatherer is gone, it like, you know, and we're not, it might happen, what, in the next 50 years that it's going to happen. Um, and I'm just curious your thoughts and perspectives on that, because it, it does seem like a very significant transition, almost like, um, you, you know, we're cutting the tether or the umbilicus to 
how we lived for most of our history. And so it kind of puts us out completely on that limb, like, okay, this better work now because this is all we have left. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm just curious how you feel about it. Yeah, and I, and I guess uh, it's, there's they'll, they'll, I think there'll always be people who are who will do hunting and and, and gathering uh, for nutritional reasons. They they think it's it's more healthy. It probably is. Uh, who who just enjoy it? Uh, who feel it it does something for them spiritually? Uh, I, I think there'll there'll be folks like that around forever. Uh, here in Wyoming, there's plenty of people who their freezers are full of of yeah. uh, antelope or elk or deer that they've that they've hunted, and they're going to keep on doing that. And as long as you manage the resource properly, uh, it it can be done indefinitely into the into the future yeah, that can be done in perpetuity but the idea of a uh, people who are ecologically integrated you know yeah i do that i got three full freezers right now but i come home in a car and sleep in a bed and yeah you know yeah. pay my taxes every year and am subservient to i'm a citizen of the united states you sure. know so so for folks who still have the independence from nation states and they also have uh, a more egalitarian uh, society. That's kind of what I'm talking about, like that piece going away, but not not necessarily contemporary, you know, foragers and hunters. I do hope that we exist in perpetuity, but I, I just can't imagine, you know, the, the people who, uncontacted tribes, as we, we sometimes call them, or in South America, I think they say like the naked people, you know, that seems to be on a, that seems to be a dead end currently. That they, they, I, I'm, I'm not really sure I'd say that there's any uncontacted people there. They've all been contacted to some extent or another. I sometimes hear about it in the in the news about these uncontacted people. And I sit there and go, are you kidding? There's an article about those people. <laughs> right, right. There's a pl- <laughs> planes flying overhead taking pictures. Yeah. yeah and and they're, they're, they're affected in some in some in of some course, respect, yeah, and, and in course. some cases, they're living the way that they're living, like the Andaman Islanders, because it's explicitly rejecting uh, mm-hmm. being incorporated into uh, into some bigger, you know, Brazilian society. But, but for they example. won't be able to make that decision forever because our desire to exploit the resources will, you right. know, outpace their ability to to kind of stay yes. away from us, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it will last. For, forever it, it, it really yeah. can't uh, un, unless there's some massive population uh, some massive deep depopulation of the of the of the world I don't see that happening I don't, that's what they're that's what they're hoping for I'm sure you know? that's what they, they might be open for yeah. it's oh not, no it's I not gonna the happen. prophecies yeah, yeah. we've, we've so, become so, too too damn clever <laughs> we sure have yeah so you're saying the 1500s where you start to pin um, the fifth beginning so tell us about how that's characterized and and then I know you're probably reluctant to make you know sweeping predictions about the future but what's the trend and where does this thing head and how do you characterize this fifth turning well the the, the real what, what's really happening is this is a level of uh, glo- glo- globalization that really started in AD 1500 when Europeans started going out and uh, discovering the parts of the world that other folks had already discovered, uh, and and colonizing it and incorporating it into this this bigger uh, system, and uh, that 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 process has cr- obviously created plenty of of problems because it raised a lot of questions about how how should people. Uh, who are very different from one another, how should they be put put together into some functioning uh, whole? And we've gone through things like slavery, uh, genocide, uh, as, as, as options of how we're going to do this. Those are not pretty. Uh, and frankly, they weren't very successful. They didn't, yeah. they didn't work. Uh, so, Although they did build the infrastructure, they did. I don't mean specifically slaves themselves, but but all of those ways of doing things, we all 
how do you say it? We're all like living on the infrastructure built from those days. And so then those things Correct. are no longer successful, but, but much of our success would, would have been very difficult with paid labor or with, without this kind of conquesting. It, 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 it probably was, uh, along with things like child labor and indentured servitude. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, uh, it, but but those are all things that the the world has pretty much rejected. I, yeah. I, I can't say a hundred percent, of course. Right. I mean, we've still got unfortunately slavery operating in certain parts of the of the world. Mm -hmm. But but it's been it's it's being more or less rejected uh, and rejected by the powers that were really at first responsible for it. Places like Europe and and the United States. So. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how the world is going to operate, right? And when we get into the 20th century, then we start seeing things like the League of Nations and then its successor, the United Nations, that are very much explicitly saying, how are we all going to get along here and, and operate? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it hasn't, obviously, it hasn't worked perfectly. Uh, and we had a new option offered to us uh, four, four years ago, which was basically, screw everyone except us. We're just going to take care of ourselves. That option doesn't work either. It doesn't. Because you can't, you're, you're, you're so intricately linked, you can't say to someone else in the world, the heck with you. We don't, we don't care yeah. about you. You think that's a really, do you think that um, as time goes on in, in people's emotional charge about this is somewhat reduced that they'll still characterize it like that. Cause trying to take a, a neutral position, it doesn't seem like it was screw everybody. It was like, Hey, why are we, um, why are we the ones who make so much sacrifice for, uh, when other nations don't, uh, do we want to be the ones leading the deindustrialization of our country? It's, 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 it's hard for me to, as an American to, travel overseas, especially into developing nations, places like Mad Madagascar, and and demand that they make sacrifices. Well, more uh, like China, I'd say. Yeah, like uh, more like countries like other other countries that are oh, that are up up and coming uh, industrialized and you're, you're right. technological nations. They they have to uh, I'm afraid China thinks it's our turn now and we're gonna do <laughs> Understandably, what, what we, what I mean, we want. Yeah, uh, right. and, and and partly, you know, it's a function of how China was 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 treated for, for yeah. so for so long, that they're now coming back and saying, well, we've got the power now, so things are going to be done, the way we want them done. Yeah, and yeah. what's what's needed. Right, right now we have a system, in which, a lot of different countries are sort of operating independently, occasionally. Uh, operating together against one mm -hmm. other place but but then that alliance sort of breaks down when it's no longer useful and you you really need a very strong centralized body in my opinion that can um enact the things that are needed in, in order to bring bad actors into line i don't think that that's warfare uh I, I, I think it's very clear that nobody nobody really wants that. Even if you're going to win in today, even if you're going to win a war, you would suffer enormously because of it. And R R Russia knows this. I mean, Putin has said after the, they took Crimea, Putin went on TV and he said, literally, remember, we have nuclear weapons <laughs> and it was just, it was just yeah. a threat to, yes, yeah. you could probably, if the rest of the world wanted to go with, to war with Russia, yeah, you could probably beat us. But in the meantime, we're going to nuke London. Serious and that's, damage. and that's, that's the collapse of the world's financial system, right, right there. How so, do so there's that, there's that, that threat. So what's needed is somebody that can, that can, um, uh, Put, put together the necessary pressures to to bring a country that's a bad actor into into line. I don't I don't see any other option except some kind of world's cooperative entity. Uh, the United Nations is our best bet. We have to get rid of the Security Council, but that's that's really what 
what we can build on there. When I hear this, when I hear you talk about it, I'm, I can't help but just sort of think about sort of Orwell and Huxley and their two visions of the future dystopia. And I sort of think of Orwell stuff is what's kind of happening in North Korea or maybe what's happening in China, a little bit more of an oppressive kind of um, totalitarian approach. And then I look at what's happening in the West and I see a more of a Huxleyan approach. Like um, as individuals give up more and more of their personal sovereignty for the collective good, we are doing it in such a way where we feel pretty happy. Like, look at all the cool stuff we have and (laughs) all the designer drugs we have. Oh, this is great. How do we get to this place you're talking about without it becoming one of those, just because history seems to show again and again and again, this despotic nature of, of human beings and our tendency toward warfare seems like, you know, so, so much of what I hear from people is like, I think so many people are so utopian, you know, the idea of like, like the world will be a John Lennon song, which is like, man, I want that, but I don't see it anywhere in our history or in our current predicament where that's actually our nature, you know? So how do we get there without, how do we have a, a, a global governance that starts to take away as if I understand too, where you're kind of headed with some of this is, is really what we have to look at is the idea of nation states altogether and the idea of individual nation sovereignty and all those kind of things. So do you sort of imagine a pathway that doesn't lead us into despotism? Well, I, if you get the right people in government, yeah, you can, you can <laughs> I think you can, you they can don't get don't seem there. to be drawn to government. I've noticed. <laughs> the, well, and that's, that, that's, that's a whole other conversation we could have. I think the, the structure of our political system, uh, draws people into government who are not really the best the best people uh the the nature of the of the whole uh in the united states the nature of campaigning the constant campaigning the amount of money that's 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 needed it all draws the worst people into uh politics a lot of sociopaths a lot of narcissists a lot of a lot of narcissists i I mean people Mm -hmm. who think uh they can it doesn't matter what they do, no one's going to hold them to account for it. And at the moment, it looks like... Seems to be true. Seems to be true. Uh, yeah. No one's going to hold you to a- account for it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we've got a... We've got a... It's, the, it's why I say in the, in the fifth beginning that really everything has to change. It's top to bottom, front to back change. Uh and I, but I can envision a world in which our culture has changed such that some behaviors would be just unthinkable. Th- th- think about this. How, how many people in the United States today would say that it, it, enslaving Africans is a good idea? Right. Uh, Completely but there was a t- very, very, I'm sure there's some jerks out there who would say yes. But if you a, could go back, an extreme radical minority, though. Yes, yeah. yes. But if you could go back two hundred years mm-hmm. and go to the South, yeah, virtually everyone would say, "Well, actually, enslavement is the best things for those folks." Right? That's right, right. that would be their their position. Uh, I hope it goes without saying they're they're completely wrong. But uh, but that's that would not be true today, mm-hmm. and that's a that's a a massive cultural shift. So what if you had a massive cultural shift in which someone like Elon Musk would say, yeah, I'm making money hand over fist, but I'm, it's all going to go out. I'm going to give it all to other organizations. It's all going to go back to my workers. I, this is just obscene for me to be making tens of thousands of dollars an hour, uh, when my, my my workers are, are 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 barely able to keep their head above water. <laughs> my brother and I were running some calculations on his hourly <laughs> the other day. It just it just makes no sense. It's, it but, makes no uh, sense. It makes no sense. But then there's also I, I guess another question I have. Uh, you know, and it's like with the agricultural revolution. You know, when it was first underway. It's not like it just looked awesome from the beginning, right? There was a lot of malnutrition. There was a lot of like physical degeneration that took place. 
yet it didn't stop it from actually fully unfolding. And so, I mean, there's stuff today that I see as you bring up this idea of, of the later stages, I would suspect of the fifth turning where it's like, man, I don't know, but this, but that, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Right. And so one question I have is, do you think it, do you imagine the world is headed for war at a, another global type? Because a lot of these new systems emerge out of the aftermath of cataclysm, right? It's, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times that's how we get to them. Mm-hmm. Do you do you sort of see it going in that direction peaceably or do you see it emerging out of, uh, of, of the ashes of something uh, a little bit traumatic? What, what I say in the fifth beginning is that the, the, the trend towards – what I like to call global self self governance is it could be done the easy way or the hard way. The hard way would be uh, well could in, could entail a, a third world world war. A third world war would be really really ugly. There are too many people with nuclear weapons and too much capacity. Some of which aren't nation states. Some, Some of, of which, which are, are not nation states. Right. Some of which are rogues, bad actors. So this is this is what terrifies the world. And it's it's partly what has sort of kept war in in check. Yeah. For, mutually for, assured for, for destruction. So because of mutually assured. In fact, after World War II, there was a an actual discussion about whether all nations should be supplied with nuclear weapons. So right. That, yeah. So, so that you, nobody, you, you can't attack any country because they've got nuclear weapons. It's a strange it, argument. It was, it was probably it was a strange, a strange argument, but it had its logic behind it. Yeah, of course. Uh, but, but we're certainly moving towards a point where the, the, the sort of developed nations, they really don't. We've we've moved away culturally from the idea that war. And the consequent loss of life is really okay. You know, when when after Trump was first in, he he sent uh, Navy SEALs in on a mission in in Yemen, and one of those SEALs died. And John John McCain said, if one if one person dies, the mission is a failure. Well, think back to just not so not so long ago on the D-Day invasion in, in Nor- Normandy, where the estimated uh, casualty rate before they went in, Eisenhower and Churchill had to estimate the, the casualties, and they estimated it, they got it pretty accurate, about 10,000 in the first 24 hours. That's, oh and about half of those are, are, are dead. Unbelievable. Now, if, if the president of the United States said, okay, we're going to do an operation in Syria or wherever, and we expect the the, the military advisors told the president, yeah, we expect ten thousand casualties in the first twenty four hours, half of those dead. Would the president say, "Yeah, go ahead"? That was a success. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no president would do that because they right. would absolutely lose the next election. Of course. Yeah. So, so we can't. We can't Some of them might actually might actually ethically think that that would be wrong too. I would hope. Oh, today, they, even, they would. They standard. would. Yeah. They would. Yeah. But but they'd probably do it for reasons of uh, election. <laughs> Unfortunately, not not, yeah. not not sort of moral reasons. But but that's that's become the attitude of a good portion of the world is we're not going to stand for that that level of of death. Mm-hmm. And and there are plenty of people who are strongly against the actions in Afghanistan that resulted in, you know, there are times when we bombed wedding parties. And my God, uh, anyone who knows war knows bad stuff happens. And, and mm. there's, there is collateral damage and you just have to accept that. In World War II, you know, we firebombed Dresden. How many innocent people died? Thousands, thousands. We fire, we firebombed Tokyo, Hiroshima, and Naga, Nagasaki. Tens of thousands of innocent people. Boy, you could not do that today. Yeah, it's amazing when just uh, any kind of you know tertiary reading of history reveals the 
the willingness to sacrifice tremendous amounts of lives um, in campaigns. It's just remarkable reading it today, but with today's logic in hand, you know, right. it's, it makes no sense today. But I do wonder too, you know, what na- there there are nations where I would question whether or not they feel that way yet. I think that that is the direction things are going. But um, yeah, I wonder sometimes, like, do does Russia feel that way? Does I know the population probably does. Does China? The population does. North does. Korea, <laughs> does Does North Korea feel that way? Like, how do you know? So it's not like everybody's fallen into line with this thinking, although functionally most of the world has. But um, yeah, I have a question for you too, and and uh, I hope it doesn't sound too leading because it's not. I really do want to get your clean perspective on it. But w- w- some of the things that have changed that we look at as really positive. So, so one example would be that we no longer sacrifice those just tremendous numbers of mostly young men that we would kind of let be rolled over by the machine of war. And so those people that they don't die that way. Now, um, we have largely conquered, uh, you know, for the most part, functionally so much of the child mortality that was as much as 50% historically for homo sapiens. We Mm -hmm. have found a way to feed so many more people, um, the the level of starvation that existed in the past is largely been eradicated yet all of these things functionally where do they lead except to more people right so uh, the agricultural revolution led to the ability to feed tremendous numbers of people which means that we now have the ability to create so many more people so now you know we talk a lot about climate change And I think sometimes we lump a lot of things in there so that we don't have to talk about them individually. Like, for instance, what are we going to do with all these people? Um, You know, so all of this, this um, caring, you know, going from, I guess, caring about just my tribe or just my community or just my nation state to caring about all the people in the world at the individual level has led to this huge swell in the human population. So I guess I want to kind of ask you about that, like how you you see, because that's in itself now that becomes an existential problem, you know? So I guess just kind of curious what you think about all that. One of the really curious trends in, in uh, human demography has been uh, a a decline in uh, the, the, the number of offspring that are, that are produced as a nation develops. So Europe, uh, Japan, the United States, uh, all developed nations appear to go through this transition from one where you had lots of offspring to ones where you don't. So I grew up in a, my mother gave birth to seven, seven children. Uh, so I grew up in a large family, but uh, none, of, none of us in, that, in my family have had more than two, two children. In other words, you're all reducing or keeping the population stable. Correct, and and some of my siblings have no off, uh, offspring. Um, in fact, I'd say our joint production is less than my mother's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you're contributing as a family to a reduction in the human population, and that and that happens in every developed nation. Some of those nations are are worried about it, and they're actually encouraging people with with money to have have more kids france has done (laughs) this Uh, i think denmark did it japan has has done it Uh, the the population growth in the united states i believe is almost entirely a function of uh immigration into the 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 u.s and and this is and the the rest of the large chunks of the world have to go through this development process they're still producing m- m- most of the the world's population growth is coming in places like india and uh, africa we're such uh, a fascinating species though because if if you talk to a biologist and you said uh let's say they studied bears and you said hey man there's been this reduction in bear fecundity where you know a mother bear might have produced 25 offspring in her life and now she's going to produce three you know that would be like cause for alarm and with ourselves, we have this way of looking at ourselves like as if we're so outside of ecology that, that oh, that this is good, right? So it's confusing to me because it's like, it doesn't feel good to me, this loss of life 
at childbirth or this loss of life in war, or this, you know, all these other ways, starvation. It also seems like not a good thing to me, the idea that we stop reproducing. My mom was one of nine. She had three. I have none. So, you know, I'm on, I understand what you're saying exactly. But like then from like the human biology perspective, it's like, oh, is that good? That's, that'd be a bottleneck in other uh, species, right? Well, per, perhaps, but there's still plenty of people around. It's, we're not an endangered species. No, no, uh, of course not. And, and most, the, it's, you know, it's, it's always hard to predict the, the future, but the world population growth hit a peak in the 1960s of about 2.2%, which is actually very, very high. Uh, it's now uh, down, a, it's been cut in half, I believe. And they expect the population to grow probably until about the end of this century. And then they expect it, the, the world population size to actually decline as more and more places reach the level of development of Europe, the United States, uh, China, Japan, their, their population growth is expected to decline and world population size will overall start to start to go down. I mean, it's not going to go down to the point where, where we're an endangered species, but it will start to decline within the next century. It will start to go down. So, you know, in an ideal world, tell me what your most optimistic fifth turning results in. Like what, what would, what would in the most, you, you know, sort of rose colored glasses view uh, of it be? Uh, Yeah. If I could put up my rose colored glasses, the, uh, the United Nations or a body like it would be a very uh, active forward looking uh, body that everyone participated in and trusted and agreed to abide by its decisions in the same way that we agreed to abide by the nation's uh, decisions. Uh, it would be a democratic uh, body, and that body would be responsible for taking care of bad actors in the, in the world, pr- preferably through nonviolent uh, means. And as a result of that, we would not have to invest the, you know, trillion dollars that we invest in, uh, in the, in the military, Mm -hmm. over, over 50% of our discretionary budget goes to the military. Imagine if we could turn all of that cash onto other, other problems, green tech, tech, technology, um, health insurance for every, every, everyone, um, uh, a, a guaranteed basic in- in- income. I, I mean, it, 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 it could be really nice. <laughs> you know, it could be really nice. What's your scale of one to 10 sort of, you know, how likely do you see positive outcomes in this? I mean, man, we're just, it's hard to not notice that we're in a very precarious moment right now. We are in a very precarious moment. And I think the next really the next decade may tell us which path we're going to go down. I mean, I mm-hmm. think we're going to get there. It's like I said, whether we're going to do it the easy way or the hard, the hard way. The, the, the next decade may, may be crucial. I have some, some, some hope even over the next 10, 10 years. I think there's reason for hope because of the, the dramatic things that have happened in the last 50 or 60 years that nobody really expected, nobody saw coming. The, the Berlin Wall came, came down. No one saw that coming. I, I mean, nobody expected it to happen. The fact that we elected uh, an African-American uh, president, if, if, if you had told me in the year 2000 that before the end of the decade, we would have an African-American president, I'd have said, no, that's, the, the country's just not ready for that yet. And, and, and yet it happened twice. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly with a re-election, yeah. Uh, so, so great and wonderful things can, can happen when there's, there's just, there are things going on that are often below our radar screen, but that are, are having a cumulative effect that produces a very rapid, 
a very rapid change. Now that can be a very bad change, but it can also be a very good one. Change is not always bad. And if we knew about an extraterrestrial race, that would turn this whole thing around pretty fast. Like, they'd get us on the fast track to be in one world, I think, real, real quick, you know? Well, it, get, our, it's kind of funny. Our, our vision of, of extraterrestrials is always, uh, it's bad. And, and, and of course, that's science fiction. It's science fiction is just, a, you know, a metaphor for our thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other people's taking, taking yeah. us, us over. It could be that an extraterrestrial race would be fantastic. Benevolent. Yeah. 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 And that, that, you know, if we knew that there was a federation of other planets or something like that, you know, then it's like, oh, let's get our act together and stop fighting each other. You know, we want to be part of that. I, I, I guess why I say that is, yeah, you know, like you're saying, you never know what black swan events will emerge. That's what they are. And so hard to, I know it's so hard to predict. Um, I have uh, just sort of like one other one other question for you. I want to make sure, did I let you finish your thought before? Sure. Okay. Um, when you talk about hunter gatherers, you can't really talk about them without it becoming really obvious how integrated they are into ecosystems and are in relationship with so many species. And one way to look at that real simply would be like, how many species do you eat in a year? Cause you kind of need to know each species in order to, you know, be able to harvest it. And so let's say, you know, depending on where you are in the world, maybe equatorially or something, they might know 200 species that they eat and they have personal relationships with them. All. I mean, they're intimate because they're making their bodies out of them. And then you look at the average American and maybe they're eating 30 species in a year. And those are increasingly genetically modified. They're raised in extremely artificial conditions. And, and we're moving toward a world where we have very little relationship with other species, except maybe our cats and our dogs and a couple of house plants. We're mostly in um, like a very anthropocentric world now where where our relationship with with other species is, is diminishing rapidly and almost for most people almost gone. So I'm wondering about as we move, move forward, how and I'm asking you this because I know that you've looked so much at hunting and gathering people, and, and that the trend has been moving us away from a relationship with the natural world. To me, it's really sad. Like I hunt and gather the way I do, partially for the nutrition, um, partially philosophically. Um, but a big part of it for me is that to me, to know other creatures that live on our planet and not just know them as an observer, but to know them as an ecological participant is really important to me. And I feel strengthened by the fact that you know, I know maple trees, not just as a, an interesting to look at tree, but I drink the sap and make the syrup out of that, you know, or that I know deer, not just as a beautiful animal that kind of lopes through the forest, but I eat them. And all of these species, they, in some way, and, in, in, you know, I feel strengthened by the um, web of interconnections that I have with other creatures. It makes me feel very anti-fragile in my ecosystem, but that's not the trend. And so in this world, as we start talking about a potential, you know, a kind of a what could for today's people look like a utopian future where we start to erase some of these nation states and this, the, this constant specter of war and all of those kind of things. Where do, what do you see the human relationship to natural, the natural world and natural places? Like, do you see us as just abandoning that or do you think that we will come to a place again where the... You know, are we destined to just be observers of nature and watching David Attenborough documentaries endlessly rerun, or do we once again ever have a relationship with the natural world? Do you think that's just over for us? Well, I hope it's not over for, for us because I, 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 if I can't get outdoors, I, I go insane. I, I go snowshoeing every every other day up in the mountains just, just, just to get out, and yeah. you know. Um, and spend time in the in the in the woods. Uh, I'll also t tell you that my religious faith is the, is the Baha'i faith, and the the Baha'i faith says that there are several places where you can sort of get spiritual understanding, and one of those is the natural world. Mm. So maintaining people's access to the natural world is is actually really important to you know the the, the development of our spiritual side, and. And so, I, I I think in the in the future, 
if I could control things, uh, I think we'd see that huge mega cities is th those are really a bad idea. That people need to be a little more spread out, so that we we preserve as some part of the natural world for people to enjoy. It's a good place to go recharge your batteries. I, I mean, I think it's really essential to to human human life. It's not just a nice thing. I think it really yeah. is essential. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and maybe that's just you know you you and me, but but I actually think for most people. Getting outdoors is something that they really love to do. And I, I remember visiting a, a castle in Germany that was built way up on top of a, of a, of a ridge. And you could look out over this, this castle and you can see the, the way that large parts of Europe have organized themselves, which is around these rather small communities, rather than putting everybody into one big city, although there are, you know, there's Paris and Berlin and so on. But many of the people live in these rather small communities that have got, uh, a, you know, a grocery store in them and kind of the basic needs are all met there. But they're separated from other places by uh, often agricultural land, but sometimes forested land that the, the Germans have done a very good job at building all kinds of trails through. It's, it's very easy to get into a little bit of nature in in some place like like Germany even though it's a heavily populated country they have they've made it a priority to make sure that people can get into the natural world fairly fairly easily so that that's that's something that the rest of the world could do living in big mega cities is really not not the best option for humans. Mm -hmm. It's the best option for capitalism, not the best option for <laughs> for human yeah. human human life. So that's that's one of the things I could see happening in the future, and it's really made possible by a lot of te technology. Uh, uh, lots of people <laughs> are can work in very remote places uh, today, yeah. myself uh, included. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and. Uh, uh, I, I can see that 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 becoming a priority is the the re rewilding of certain uh, land, mm -hmm. landscapes, and that's going to require that we basically take charge of of nature, and we've in a sense already done that. I mean, here in Wyoming, the the game and fish, the state game and fish, decides how many fish, how many uh, hunting licenses can be. Uh, can be available for a given uh, hunt uh, area. They're they're trying to regulate what happens to the animal pop population, and that may be what we have to do on a on an even bigger bigger scale. And there's big chunks of the landscape that I think we should just uh, abandon them and re re rewild them. I'm going to have to talk to you again at some point to dig into some of that because there's a lot there <laughs> I want to say. But uh, but over, over, overall, I want to say that uh, your tone comes across optimistically. Um, I, I don't. I'm not getting a real strong pessimism from you about the future, which is well. Um, I'll, I'll be. I'll be honest. I'm personally a very pes pessimistic person. <laughs> my, my wife. My <laughs> wife can tell you that I am. I am. Yeah, definitely a glass is half empty kind of person. But. But I do find, after reading all, lots of books, especially the climate change books, uh, they they end up on a note of, well, there's nothing we can do. Mm. There's nothing yeah. we can do, and so we're screwed. And I I get done with that, and I go, well, there's if there's nothing to do, then uh, well, I'll do nothing. Yeah, and, and I'm and getting if, an F-150. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so if I if I take a more optimistic perspective, I think. It, it leaves people with the idea that yeah we can we can fix this we can we can do something um, you know not to sound too Pollyannish but you know we can make a better a better world mm -hmm. it can be yeah. done and in fact it it can it can be done yeah yeah and I, it's like optimism is a psychological technology almost you know yes um, yeah. man tell people um, where they can get your book where do you like to send people and how do people um, learn you know more about what you know you're writing or, or your talks and things like that oh uh, 
gee, I don't know, I'm at the University of Wyoming and I have a bit of a web page there. Uh, the, the book's available, the, the, fifth, the fifth beginning. Oh, it's available through Amazon. Uh, it's from the University of California Press. It's, it's, it's fairly easy to get, and it's short. There are several videos uh, with you online as well. People can hear you talking a bit more about the book and, and some of this philosophy as well, right? I've, I've lectured on the book, and some of those lectures are uh, freely available uh, online. If you just do the fifth beginning and, and video, you'll, you'll find it. Dr. Robert Kelly, it's been a really stimulating conversation for me. I really appreciate your perspectives and uh, the work you do. And I just uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to, to let me kind of pick away at you like this. Well, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.